So tonight, again, we're continuing our seminar on dinosaurs and God's Word. And tonight we're going to be looking at, did dinosaurs actually turn into birds? So last week, or last week, well, last night we ended up looking at, again, an introduction, again, differences between biases, between the evolutionary ideas versus creation ideas. And again, and we all have the same evidence, but again, it's all about how you interpret that evidence and what kind of bias you bring to the table. And again, we as Christians, we tend to admit our bias, but the evolutionists try to say that they're not biased. They don't want to actually admit their biases against God in that regard. We also saw last night that dinosaurs did not live millions of years ago. We saw that that are we got some definitions of what dinosaurs are again they're land animals they're not the water reptiles that we marine reptiles that we saw or the pterosaurs stuff so those are different classifications but we tend to all just put them all together the same thing so tonight again we're going to see what happened to the dinosaurs did they actually turn into birds so that is the idea evolution wants us to think this and so now let's get into it so let's see where are we at so again dinosaurs turning into birds is a common misconception that a lot of evolutionists try to bring about they try to really push this agenda quite a bit this has been a common theme over the last several decades of them really trying to push this idea that dinosaurs slowly started changing and became birds that we see today around us in fact, they even try to say that we still got dinosaurs around today. It's all the birds that are around us and everything. Those are dinosaurs. And, of course, they actually do not. Or, sorry, they did not actually turn into birds. And secular scientists, again, state this as a matter of fact. However, they don't actually offer any type of evidence. And you even have a lot of movies. Again, we mentioned Jurassic Park quite a bit last night in Jurassic World. And the reason why is because they're probably the most well-known dinosaur movies out there. The last Jurassic World movie they had called Dominion actually went a step further than any of the other ones before it. While they've mentioned this concept in the other movies, Jurassic World Dominion, the last one they made, actually started depicting dinosaurs with feathers. So here's a clip from the opening scene of Jurassic World Dominion. And it actually shows the Transaurus Rex with feathers on it. It's probably an ad. Yep. Yeah, I know. Sorry, YouTube. <laughs> Hopefully you can see it pretty good. There's our feathered dinosaur, our feathered T-Rex. And a lot of violence here. Hmm. But you really get a close-up view right there of the feathers that they placed on this T-Rex right here. And a lot of people who end up, a lot of people who end up watching these movies, they tend to think that, yes, there are feathers on dinosaurs or that they did have these feather-like things on there. So the big question is, why do evolutionists think dinosaurs turned into birds? So again, they try to figure out why do, di why do evolutionists think this? Why do they believe this concept here? So the reason why evolutionists actually believe this is because they want to change how animals are actually categorized in taxonomy to try to connect everything. According to the theory of evolution, everything connects to one organism and everything spanned off of that or spawned off of that. 
But the crazy thing is, we look at the taxonomical order of things, the kingdoms, phylums, and all that stuff. There's differences between all of them where they do not interconnect at all. And therefore, to try to get those connections, they're wanting to reclassify everything to try to bring that connection together. And so they're trying to connect everything in what they call phylogenics. So, yeah, that's what I said. So phylogenics is what they're actually trying to turn the taxonomical orders of, again, the kingdoms, the phylums and stuff, and bring everything there. So phylogenics is the evolutionary relatedness among groups of organisms, basically how things are interrelated with each other. So they're trying to prove and show that all these things are connected to one another and that they are related to each other. So the way they do this in phylogenics, they use sequence data to infer relationships for both organisms and the genes that they manipulate. So they'll look at a lot of the data between the genomes as well as the bone structures and stuff, and they try to simply put everything together to see if there's any type of relationship between them. And if they think that there's one, then they make a connection whether there's an actual connection there or not. And again, trying to build this family tree and making sure, showing that everything is connected. So again, they're trying to manipulate a lot of the data to fit this perspective even though there's no, re there's no actual um, proof for any of it. Again, there's actually again, nothing that actually shows this has actually happened here. So this approach, again, is pushing a very strong evolutionary bias. Instead of looking at the data and following where it leads, it is manipulating the data to draw conclusions that would link different kinds of animals together to give evidence for evolution. So this is, a, this is because there's a lack of missing links in the fossil record. We talked about that last night just a little bit, that you don't actually see transitional forms in the fossil record. You see full-fledged animals. There's nothing in between a dog and a cat or a dog and this or that or whatever. They're all as they are seen today. So you have none of these transitional forms in the fossil record. And if you see here, we have kind of a family tree that they've built for dinosaurs. And the crazy thing is, on any of these type of evolutionary trees that they have, all the tips of the trees at the top and stuff, those are actually animals and stuff that we have. But if you actually go down toward the bottom where it has all the connected points and stuff, there's no proof for any of that. It's all speculation. They actually do not have any proof to, that connects any of these things. It's just their own inferences and their own biases to put it together. So, again, they're trying to show the interconnectedness of everything. And while I'm thinking about it, because I forgot to mention it when we got started. So, a couple of things. First off, there are some freebie stuff out there on the tables and whatnot. I know some of the, a lot of the kids got some of that last night and everything. And I'm glad for that. There's also a question box out there as well if again, anybody has any questions about anything whether it's in the seminar or just Bible related in general and whatnot tomorrow at the end we'll have a question answer service again and so we'll answer any questions that you may have about just whatever pretty much so again Bible related please though <laughs> alrighty and we do actually have some prizes for some of the kids that we meant to give out last night a little bit but we forgot to do that as well, and I do apologize. Uh, that was kind of a spur of the moment thing by the pastor. So, <laughs> so, but we are going to try to take care of some of that tonight as well as we go through some things. So, another reason why evolutionists are trying to say that uh, dinosaurs turned into birds is that they're actually changing a lot of definitions. So, in order to actually prove this point, they actually change how we define certain things. So, they actually changed the word dinosauria or dinosaur to actually start to include birds. If you actually, if you looked at the definition of dinosaur probably 30 to 40 years ago, you wouldn't see a bird, anything about birds mentioned. They're reptiles, and as we described yesterday, yesterday again, they have hip structures, either bird-like or lizard-like. They have their legs underneath them, and it raises their body off the ground. That classifies a dinosaur. But within the last 
five to ten years now if you look up the def definition of dinosaur lo and behold you're going to see bird there with it in the definition so they are adding this to the definition to try to change what a dinosaur actually is they've also changed the definition of birds believe it or not did you know birds do not actually have to have feathers and not all feathered creatures are birds Wow, didn't know that. So they actually have this thing called non-avian dinosaurs, they try to say. So this right here would be considered a non-avian dinosaur. So they're trying to say that there are some dinosaurs that did not turn into birds and some dinosaurs that did turn into birds. Again, good old T-Rex right here is one that they said tried to turn into a bird, as we saw in the clip from Jurassic World. I don't know about you, but with those little bitty arms, I don't think he'd fly very far if he jumped off a cliff. Yeah, he had to lose quite a bit of weight, too. That tail isn't meant for flying, either. So they not only changed the definition of dinosaur and also that of birds, they also changed the definition of feathers. Can you believe it? They changed the definition of a lot of stuff here. They, uh, evolutionists and atheists, secular scientists, paleontologists, those that are trying to push this idea that dinosaurs did, in fact, turn into birds, if you want to know who they are. <laughs> so. so the definition of feathers, they change feathers to include any filament that can be argued to be a precursor to a feather. So any type of filament that is found in the fossils or whatnot, they can sit there and argue that this is a precursor to a feather. It's a proto-feather. And whatnot is going to turn into a feather. This is what mate ends up becoming a feather. So any of these filament things they find in the fossil record, they actually end up, again, trying to say that is included with the term feather also. So it's not just feathers as we know them today, but anything that may be a precursor to that. So how on earth did this happen? So how on earth did this end up happening? Evolutionists give us the process of how they believe that dinosaurs ended up turning into birds. So they claim that the theropod dinosaur turned into the birds. A theropod dinosaur is all these right here. Look, again, T-Rex is a good example of that, of a theropod dinosaur standing up on two back legs and standing up straight and upright. So again, they're arguing that the theropod dinosaurs are the ones that turned into the birds. The crazy thing is, and Pastor Harding pointed this out last night a little bit, is that, well, if those are the ones that turned into the birds, those are the lizard-hipped ones, right? Now, yes, they are. Ironically, they're the lizard-hipped dinosaurs, not the bird-hipped dinosaurs. Their hips are, are lizard-like, not bird-like. So does that, that doesn't really make much sense. So now they're going to have to go from lizard hips and evolve into bird hips and then end up going into birds as well and whatnot. So again, the evidence does not even match the terminology that they're trying to, that they put out there to describe the differences between the dinosaurs. And instead of fully developed feathers, again, some uh, theropod dinosaurs actually ended up having some type of quills and stuff on them. Proto feathers is what they try to say. Here in this fossil, you can kind of see along the neck and spine, there's this little black areas and stuff, and they try to say, well, that's precursors to feathers. Those are feathers right there and everything. So those are proto feathers, all right? So they're pre-feathers. Again, so all these things along the neck and the spine of the dinosaur, again, they're saying those are early feathers of the dinosaurs had. Some dinosaurs also had long quill-like structures. You can kind of see, hopefully, let me get over here where I can actually laser point a little bit. Ah. So right in this area right here, you have some markings going up and down like this. Again, those are actually quill-like features that came off of the dinosaur and everything. So they're trying to argue that, see, those are precursors to quills, feather quills and stuff and everything. And those will end up turning into feathers as well. So, again, they like arguing about feathers being on dinosaurs or precursors to feathers being there. Now, all these structures, or so all these things are used to indicate that dinosaurs slowly turned into birds. 
and they slowly evolved feathers. However, so here's a quote from one of the things I looked up in preparing for this. So a bird didn't just evolve from a T-Rex overnight, but rather the classic features of birds evolved one by one. First, bipedal locomotion, which would be, again, your theropod dinosaur. And then feathers. Then a wishbone. Then more complex feathers that look like quill pin feathers. Then wings. Uh, Bristate said, The end result is a relatively seamless transition between dinosaurs and birds. So much so that you can't just draw an easy line between these two groups. So they're saying that they evolved so slowly and so smoothly into birds, you can't really sit there and say, all right, this is a dinosaur and this is a bird. You can't tell the difference by looking at the two on the evolutionary scale. Yes? Um, no, but we're going to get to that in a little bit. So, again, they're trying to say that this is such a smooth transition, you can't even tell the difference as you go through the evolutionary process between dinosaurs and birds. I don't know about you, but this does not look like a duck or a goose. So, little dude, what's your name? Huh? Luke, just like the gospel writer in the, Bi in the Bible? Yeah? So, what's your favorite dinosaur? Tyrannosaurus rex? The T-Rex? What? Oh, Spinosaurus. Ah, oh, I like Spinosaurus too. He kind of looks like this, except his jaw is a little bit longer and he has his big quill spine on the back, which is why they call him Spinosaurus. So, Luke, come here real quick, buddy. So, you say you like Spinosaurus. I don't think we got any Spinosaurus stuff up here, but we do got a little T Rex here, or a footprint. Got a bunch of little dudes there. You got the big coloring thing right there. What would you like? This one? All right, there you go. So, all right. So, try to have a few other things going on. Giveaways a little bit. Hi. It is. Um, you do have a Brachiosaurus and a Seismosaurus. They're all seropod dinosaurs like this right here, but I don't really know any of them that have the big thing like this. You do have a Stegosaurus that has the plates, but it's smaller, doesn't have the long neck and everything, it has spikes on the tail. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. It's a little, uh, the one that has the big spine that's really small, it's kind of short and stubby. Yeah, I can't remember the name of that one. <laughs> you, you got Google. All righty. So even though I know a lot about dinosaurs, I cannot remember all the names of all of them because there's a lot of them. All righty. So let's see, where are we at? So again, evolutionists claim that they have found dinosaur fossils with feathers as well. They claim that there's actually been fossils of dinosaurs that had legitimate feathers and somebody mentioned that last night, that, well, they found fossils of feathers on stuff. It's like, yeah, they found fossils of feathers, but they're not dinosaurs, as we're going to see here in a moment. So we've kind of seen the process here of what they claim. Again, they have all these feathers and stuff that ends up showing that they turn into dinosaurs. A few other things that they actually have done. Scientists have actually gone in on chicken embryos and stuff and changed the genetic code just a little bit to remove the beak and to see what it looked like if it wasn't a hard like a bird's beak. And they say, well, it looks like the mouth of a dinosaur. So just because you went in and changed and knew what genes to change to get rid of that does not mean that it happened naturally that these things automatically moved from this to that and knew which ones to make to turn into the hard beak that a bird would have. So genetic manipulation really doesn't prove a point just proves that you can go in and change it to make it what you want it to be and everything. So let's look at the evidence. Let's take another look at their evidence they have for turning dinosaurs into birds. So the question is, 
Did theropods really turn into birds? Well, the reasons evolutionists believe this is that they both walk on hind legs. So, they, so birds walk on two legs, right? When they walk. So, so did the theropod dinosaurs. They walk on two legs. Yep. And they also have three toes. Birds generally have three big toes. Well, so do the theropod dinosaurs. They have three toes pretty much in the front. So this is part of their reasoning. Okay, well, they have, they're bipedal and they have three toes, so they must be the same. I got five fingers, and so does an ape. doesn't mean I'm the same thing as it, although sometimes I'm hard-headed like one. But at any rate... So again, that is not really good evidence. Just because you have something that looks similar doesn't mean that they one came from another. All right. So again, this actually cannot happen. Again, going from theropods to dinosaurs again that can or dinosaurs I'm sorry into birds, theropods into birds again cannot actually happen. And one of the big reasons why this can't happen is because you have a difference between cold-blooded and warm-blooded. Lizards and reptiles, dinosaurs are cold-blooded. We've all learned cold-blooded and warm-blooded, right? So, Lamar, you're shaking your head about, so cold-blooded, you know how that they stay warm? Do you know how they stay warm? No? I, th I thought you said you remembered it. So, all right, so again, dinosaurs are cold-blooded, birds and mammals are warm-blooded, and there's a big difference between the two and everything. So I always have to laugh when people say, well, I'm cold-blooded and everything. I get cold really easy. No, you're warm-blooded, you're just cold-natured. You get cold very easily, you're cold-natured. We're about to go over that. <laughs> oh, I know. So... Warm-blooded animals, we'll look at them first. So birds, mammals, warm-blooded animals, they are in, what we call endothermic. So they are endothermic. Endothermic is just a big fancy word for meaning that you can ma maintain your core body temperature on your own. So we actually have self-regulating body temperature, which means our bodies themselves will keep a steady temperature we do not have to rely on an outside source for our body to stay on an average of 98.6 degrees. So we can basically keep that ourselves. Again, birds and mammals, they all share this quality, being endothermic. Again, ma maintaining their own core body temperature. Cold-blooded animals are ectothermic. So they're what they call ectothermic. It almost sounds like the Ghostbusters there. But, again, ectothermic, again, is just a fancy term for that these animals rely on outside sources to maintain their core body temperature. Anybody ever seen a snake or a lizard sunning? You know why they do it? It's to get warm, to stay warm. Yes. They, they're out there in the sun, laying in the sun, because they're trying to soak up as much heat as they possibly can why? Because they are cold blooded. They have no way to maintain their own body temperature. So they have to rely on the sun and a lot of heat to keep them warm. Why do you think you don't see snakes and lizards and stuff a lot in the winter time? Because they go find a warm place to burrow down and stay warm through the winter until the winter's over. Then they can come back out where it's warmer. Otherwise they will die because they'll freeze to death. They have to find something to keep themselves warm. And that's why usually they'll go underground or they'll go under a bunch of old dead leaves or twigs, sticks and stuff, again, to keep themselves warm and everything throughout the winter. So again, so endothermic, warm-blooded, again, we can maintain our own body temperature. The cold-blooded, ectothermic, they have to have an outside source, generally the sun or other things to keep them warm. Now, how do you go from cold-blooded to warm-blooded? You don't. Uh, you, you don't really do that. Also, by the way, fish are cold-blooded too. But, yeah, so fish are also cold-blooded. So fish, reptiles, amphibians are all cold-blooded. Birds and mammals are warm-blooded. 
That's the divide there. Now, evolutionists, because they know this is a big problem, going from cold-blooded to warm-blooded, they argue that some dinosaurs were endothermic. So they actually try to say that some dinosaurs could actually maintain their own body temperature on their own. Well, no, they did not need an outside source to keep them warm. However, the problem is that there is absolutely no evidence for this whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you about how they try to prove it. So they do try to prove this, but really there's no evidence for this at all. The reason why they claim this is because in some dinosaur fossils and bones that they found, they argue that dinosaurs have these things called osteons. So they have these things in their bones along the spine, in the vertebrae of the spine, called osteons. Osteons are a very complex, concentric layer of bone that surrounds your blood vessels in areas where bones are dense. So you have these very thick, concentric layers of bone that surrounds various blood vessels that go through your spinal cord and through the vertebrae. And these things right here are said to actually help to regulate your body temperature. All right. So, yes, there are some dinosaurs that have these things. And so they argue that this right here proves that they are that they were actually warm-blooded and not cold-blooded. So, like I said, this is considered proof of endothermic abilities. Again, that they have the ability to be warm-blooded. So to kind of get a visual of what we're talking about here, here's the slide. So there you have the osteon circled over there. That thing's protruding up out of that vertebra. That is what is the osteon. And they're trying to say that that right there is what keeps the dinosaurs from being cold-blooded and makes them warm-blooded. However, the problem is that that just does not work. All large animals actually have this feature. Every large animal you come across actually has this feature, including reptiles that we have around today, and even tuna fish. And you're not going to be able to argue that these are warm-blooded because we know for a fact, we can observe it, we can test it, we can see it, that they are actually cold-blooded. So moder large modern reptiles have these things, and even tuna fish, which is a big, huge fish, right? Yeah, same pictures of tuna and everything. Again, no one's going to argue a fish is warm-blooded. And so, again, you have these things here. We can test it. We know that these are cold-blooded animals. So osteons do not prove that you are automatically warm-blooded if you have them. We have cold-blooded animals here that have them. And we, right in front of us. They also try to argue that the theropods, that their, the eggs and their brooding behavior prove warm-blooded abilities as well. So that we do actually know a little bit about how dinosaurs laid their eggs and kept them and this and that because of the fossils we have. We actually have dinosaur eggs in fossilized form and nests and stuff like that that they've found. So we can actually look at some of their brooding behavior of how they lay their eggs and nest them and this and that. So they try to argue, okay, this right here, the way they do this helps show that they're warm-blooded as well. However, there is no known theropod brooding behavior that we don't see in living reptiles today. The way that their eggs are laid out, the way that they nest them and this and that, is just how snakes and alligators and other reptiles we see today do. So again, they're all cold-blooded. So does that prove that the dinosaurs are warm-blooded if they're doing the exact same thing as their cold-blooded reptiles today? Probably not. Probably not. So let's get to the hip bones because the hip bones are pretty fun. So, again, lizard hip versus bird hips. We talked about this a little bit last night. There's two different uh, hip structures for dinosaurs. You have bird hip and lizard hip. Of these two right here, which one would you automatically assume would be the bird-hipped one? The T-Rex or the sauropod? You'd think the T-Rex, but you're wrong. The T-Rex is a lizard hip. The sauropod here is a bird hip. <laughs> yep. 
So the T-Rex the actually has a lizard hip structure, while the sauropod has more of a bird hip structure. And actually the ter uh, Triceratops has more of that than even the sauropod does. Yeah, well, this is the way the structures are, and they are legit, because they look more like bird hips than they do lizard hips. That's why they give them those names, the way they're structured, the way they're formed. So again, most bird hip dinosaurs look less like birds than the lizard hipped ones. Again, here you see a triceratops up here. Again, they are claimed to have a bird hip. Where you have the theropod, again, claimed to have a lizard hip. And again, the difference is between these structures right in here, where you have the red right there. Again, the lizard hip ones are able to walk like we do, move from the hip. And the bird hipped ones, though, they move from the knee. So they actually walk by the knee, and they don't actually move their hips while they move and walk. So that's the difference between the two right there. And also how everything connects to their tails and stuff also, muscles and stuff, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. So, again, the hip structure is completely wrong for theropods to turn into birds. They are completely wrong. They had to have, should have the bird hip, right? If you're going to turn into a bird, you should have the, the precursor of the bird hip there to do so. And that is just, again, completely off. Also, they have different lung structures. Birds and reptiles have different lung structures. And this right here is a very well-preserved theropod dinosaur fossil. And down here, right in this area right in here, you can see a little bit of the lung cavity. And the lung cavity actually ends up resembling more of that of a crocodile than it does a bird. So their lung structures are more reptilian than they are avian. So again, there's nothing there to really help to show that they actually turned into birds. They, if they look more like a, repti a modern reptile, then are they not just reptiles? That would be the question, right? So the big question then is, okay, well, we went over all this stuff, but did dinosaurs really have feathers? First person to raise their hand and tell me the answer to that, it gets a prize. Yeah, so do dinosaurs have feathers? All right, all right, come here, you get a prize. And for that answer right here, I will give you this one thing that the pastor bought that actually has a feathered dinosaur on it. So good job, all right. So, so yeah. So, again, just another proof that what the, the world is trying to push this concept on everybody, especially kids, to where they can actually think that this is it. So did dinosaurs really have feathers? That is the argument. So are we actually looking at early feathers? Again, the filament that we see on the back of the neck and spine of these uh, theropod dinosaurs, again, those are actually filament fibers. All right, so those are filament fibers. We do know that. But guess what? There are animals today, lizards today, that have these type of things. Do those look like, does that look like feathers to you? Again, those are probably some of the same things that these animals had that we see in the fossil record where they just have this filament fiber spines going over the back. It's more for decoration than it is anything. It's not actually feathers. Also, some of the filament fibers are actually left over from collagen. So collagen is actually the glue that really actually holds all your skin and stuff together and everything. So if your collagen is very weak, then your skin is going to get you know, weak and brittle and frail. So the more collagen you have, the stronger it is. Well, when you break down and everything fossilizes and stuff, then the the filament fibers that are left over in the rocks are actually the breakdown of that collagen. So it looks like filament fibers, but it's actually the collagen that is broken down. And they try to claim, well, that's feathers. No, that's just a breakdown of the skin. And we have seen this many, many times. In fact, even secular scientists and paleontologists even argue this. The fibers show a striking similarity to the structure and levels of organization of dermal collagen. The proposal that these fibers are protofeathers is dismissed. And this is a secular paleontologist. 
So they're getting dermal collagen, right? Collagen in your skin. So all those filaments and stuff, all those fibers came from the skin. Proto feathers, this whole idea should be dismissed. And this actually came back all the way in 2007 when this was reported and published. And you'd think that being that far removed, they would just give up on this narrative. But do evolutionists tend to give up on narratives just because they're proven wrong? And the answer would be no. In fact, we actually do find fossilized dinosaur skin quite a bit. They have found a lot of dinosaur skin fossilized, as you can see here. And as you can see, there are no feathers. It is scaly just like reptile skin is today. If you look at a snake or alligator, crocodile, lizard, whatnot, it looks pretty similar to that. But there's no feathers. In fact, the funny thing is the Smithsonian will sit there and have all these illustrations of feathered dinosaurs and whatnot, even T-Rex with feathers on them and stuff, but yet on their own website, they sit there and say, T-Rex was likely covered in scales, not feathers based off of the evidence that we have. But yet it doesn't stop them from paying people to paint and draw and make dinosaurs, even T-Rex, have feathers on them, even though the evidence doesn't support it. Why? Because they don't care about the evidence. They care about their narrative of what they're trying to put out there. They're trying to build this evolutionary framework and show proof that it exists. So... The crazy thing is also that not only are there no feathers actually found on dinosaurs and stuff or proto feathers, but fossilized feathers are actually been found below rock layers containing dinosaurs. They have actually found birds as well as feathers and have been fossilized underneath rock layers that actually had dinosaurs. So if you go on an evolutionary time scale, it would try to say that those feathers predated the dinosaurs. But guess what they do with that evidence? Let's just go over here. We're going to hide it. We don't want to look at this because why? It doesn't fit their story that they're trying to tell. So there are many dinosaurs that they claim that have feathers. They're, they have several dinosaurs that they claim that did have feathers and whatnot. The group of dinosaurs they claim for this is Manny Raptora. Manny Raptora. So the word raptor, and we do actually have birds that are called raptors, and there are dinosaurs called raptors. Well, why are they called raptors? Because dinosaurs turned into birds? No. Raptor actually deals with the talons on their feet. And so raptors are like uh, birds are kind of like eagles and hawks and owls. They are considered a raptor because of the way their talons are on their, beak, or on their feet, I mean. And, again, the velociraptors, stuff like that, dinosaurs, they're considered that way, too, because of the talons on their feet, the claws that they have on their feet. So, many raptora, again, this is a group of theropod dinosaurs that many paleontologists believe birds were derived from some 150 or so million years ago during the Jurassic period. Again, they always like that millions of years ago nonsense that is going on. So let's look at some examples of some of the Manoraptora, some different types of these animals here. So the first one we have is Pyroraptor. Pyroraptor, I guess he's a firebird, I don't know. So this, this dinosaur right here, or this fake dinosaur right here, actually ends up playing a dominant role in Jurassic World Dominion. In fact, he's one of the main antagonists here, and you can see down here with him approaching these two people on ice, walking towards them and whatnot. And the cold doesn't seem to bother this reptile and whatnot because he has feathers and apparently he was warm-blooded too. So, again, he's like the main character there. And here he's shown to have plumage of feathers, webbed feet, and the ability to swim in ice-cold water in the movie. The problem is there is absolutely no proof that this animal was able to do it. There's actually even, not even any real proof that this animal existed. So the evidence they used to reconstruct this animal are ten bones and some teeth. 
All the bones you see right there, that's all they had. And they made this entire animal based off of that. Man, they're good. They're very inventive, very creative people. So if you look here, what not, again, you look at the evidence, there's no evidence of web feet or feathers. Again, all this is assumed in creating the mind of the people who made the drawings and digital reconstructions for the movie. Also, again, dinosaurs would, do not do well in cold environments, which is why many think they went extinct in the first place. Because the environment got too cold for them where they could not thrive very well. We'll talk more about that tomorrow because we want to find out what happened to the dinosaurs. Anybody remember from last night? What happened to the dinosaurs? You're right, they died. Do y'all want a prize <laughs> for remembering? All right. So the next one that they end up having is Archaeoraptor. So Archaeoraptor was one of the first big ones that they had of a feathered dinosaur. And if you see here or whatnot, you kind of see some makeouts of what appear to be feathers along the outsides there and whatnot. And again, this specimen came from China and was found, to, but it was actually found to be fake back in the year 2000. In the year 2000, they discovered this is a fake fossil. Here's a quote discovering this. So after observing a the new feathered dromosaur specimen in a private collection and comparing it with the fossil known as Archaeoraptor, I have concluded that Archaeoraptor is a composite. The tail portions of the two fossils are identical, but other elements of the new specimen are very different from Archaeoraptor, in fact, more closely resembling Sonorothosaurus. Yeah, this is why I don't remember all their names very well. So though I do not want to believe it, Archaeoraptor appears to be composed of a dromaeosaur tail and a bird body. So basically the guy who found this took two different fossils, took a bird body and a dinosaur tail and smacked them together. And said, here you go, here's a, bird, here's a dinosaur of feathers, and it, that is not the case. Again, this has been proved over and over again to be fake. In fact, even evolutionists don't even use it anymore. But it helps to prove a point that... Well, evolutionists go quite far to try to prove something, right, and try to show things. And they're quick to jump on stuff without actually looking into it. So another feathered dinosaur they try to put out there is Archaeoteryx. Archaeoteryx. And just looking at that, what would you just assume it automatically was? If you actually looked at that and saw the wings and the feathers and stuff, what would you think it actually was just by looking at it? Right, you probably think it's just a fossilized bird, right? Well, guess what? That's exactly what it was, a fossilized bird. But they want to try to say that it was a missing link between dinosaurs and birds. And it was touted this for several years as being that missing link. However, new research has shown that it is not even related, or sorry, that it is not related to dinosaurs, but in fact just an extinct bird. So given this iconic role, Archaeoteryx has also been in the crosshairs of creationists and remains a lightning rod for political debates and legal proceedings about teaching evolution in schools. Of course, zoo and co-workers' finding only deepens the impact of Archaeoteryx by highlighting the rich evolutionary nexus of which it is a part. But how the ever-clever creationist community will spin, it remains to be seen. So again, they've shown that this is just a bird, but all right, well, those creationists, how are they going to spin this to fit their ideas? The sad thing is we don't have to spin anything. Y'all just sit there and just show that you're lie you've lied and messed up for you know several decades and whatnot, and we don't have to spin anything. It's, I always have to laugh how we're the ones always manipulating everything, and they, they don't manipulate anything. Oh, man, poor things. So there is actually a well-known problem of fakery coming out of China. It's been a well-known problem for ten years, last 10 years that fake fossils have been coming out of China where people have been just sitting there taking various things, sticking them together and making what are fake fossils. Now the, the rock itself are actually real, but when they put them all together, glue it together, they're actually making fake animals <laughs> out of the fossils. 
So again, we've known this for the last 10 years or better. In fact, an investigative report published in Science in 2010 revealed that as many as 80% of marine reptile fossils on display in Chinese museums have been altered or manipulated. Huh? Yeah. So again, 80% of their marine reptiles have found out to be fake in their museums in China. That's quite a bit. That's quite a bit to be wrong. Paleontologist Craig Dertzler from the University of New Orleans in Louisiana stated that almost every one that I've seen Chinese bird fossil on the commercial market has, has some reconstruction to make it look prettier. So they've gone through, and almost all the bird fossils coming out of China, they've gone through trying to make it look nicer and prettier and added things to it to where it gives it more definitive features and such. And if you start manipulating things, can you trust it? You start editing things, can you trust it? Mm. No. So the farmers do not believe this is wrong. The farmers referring to the people who are creating these fake fossils. They look at it as restoring an art object to make it more marketable. The whole commercial market for fossils has gotten riddled with fakery. You have to be very careful in looking at fossils in the open market because, again, there are so many fakes out there that even trained paleontologists can end up being fooled very well because they've gotten so good at it. The only way you can actually test to see if a fossil is fake or not is by doing it through x-ray scans and stuff like that where you can actually see the glue fibers and stuff because they're so well done you can't actually see it with the naked eye. So you have to be very, very careful with that. So there are actually no known dinosaurs with, or with feathers. There are no known dinosaurs with feathers. There's, again, there, every last one of them are either a bird or, again, they are fake. Fetisudia and co-workers have presented a substantial body of evidence to support that, or view that there were, are, in fact, no known dinosaurs that have feathers. This is a study that was done in 2005, showing again that there are no dinosaurs that have feathers, and we've known for almost, 10, or almost 20 years now, and yet somehow we still get this pushed on us and everything. Here's a quick video they also help illustrate a little bit of a point because bird fossils have actually been found in the same levels as dinosaur fossils. So, again, basically, again, they're saying that they have in some of these museums back in the back, not out in front on display, where they found bird fossils with dinosaur fossils in the same layers that dinosaur fossils should be found. So how could one turn into another? They both lived at the same time. So the question is here. So let's look at something real quickly because I know it's getting close to time, but we started a little bit late, so I'm going to give myself an extra five minutes. So, is this a bird or a dinosaur? dinosaur? Looks like a dinosaur. All right, what about that? Is that a bird or a dinosaur? All right, what if I told you that's the same skeleton? Just, just manipulated to look the way that you want it to look. That's what they do with a lot of these things. They take a skeleton and then they start moving it around digitally to get it into the features that they want it to have and everything. 
is the same skeleton, but again, posed differently. So the question would be, if we're looking at fossils, how do we tell the difference between a dinosaur fossil and a bird fossil? How will we know the difference between what a dinosaur fossil would look like and a bird fossil? Well, the first thing is the obvious thing. Does it have feathered wings? <laughs> if it has feathered wings, then guess what? It's a bird. So, again, they're clearly defined. It looks like feathered wings. Again, it is a bird if it has feathers and wings. There's a check mark for birds there. So the next thing to look at the fossil is looking at the wrist bones. Is there actually a swivel wrist? See, lizards and even us, our wrists do not, go, we go back and forth, but it cannot go side to side very well. Birds, however, their wrist bones can bend all the way over like this. They don't go this way, they bend to the side. And the reason why they bend to the side like that, and I'm Again, you can't hardly do it. You can do this, whatever. Some people can do it a little bit better. Yeah, the wrist itself doesn't move and whatnot. My wife's double-jointed in her wrist, so she's sitting there showing off over there. But she's part bird. <laughs> so, anyway. But again, so the bird's wrists end up going this way, swiveling off to the side. That way they can tuck their wings up against their body and underneath themselves. So they're able to tuck their arms or their wings underneath them with that swivel wrist. So again, if they have wings and feathers and swivel wrists, then it's automatically a bird. If it's not a swivel wrist, then it's a dinosaur. Because if you just look at it, at those pictures without actually looking at the wrist structure, do they kind of look a little similar? Looks what? Crab legs. <laughs> You, you, just, you, just, you just want to go back down to the gulf, that's all it is. So, again, swivel wrist also indicates a bird, all right? And then finally, the last question to ask, what about the tail? Does the fossil have a tiny, fused tail? If you look there at the top of this, you see these tails are not very long. Some of them are longer than others, but that blue indication there is all vertebrae that's fused together. Birds have their tails fused because that ends up helping them in flight, in navigation with their tail feathers. Dinosaurs do not have fused vertebrae in their tails, and they are exceptionally longer than bird tails. The reason why a T-Rex has such a long, meaty tail and everything is so it helps him to balance while he walks. So all that extra muscle and everything back here is to help provide balance so he can end up walking and not falling over every time he turns around. He already has little arms. I mean, he has to have something to help him out a little bit. All right. So he's already, he's already handicapped enough. I mean, come on. So, again, that's why they end up having that. Also, remember we talked about the difference between lizard hip and bird hip, right? And everything. So lizard hip dinosaurs, their anchor points of the muscles and tendons are so, again, that it ends up providing balance. The bird-hipped ones, the tails are actually smaller, like in the triceratops and such. They're not as long as the T-Rex or as big because they don't need it for balance. They're on all fours, and their muscle structure does not actually, is very weak right there. And the same thing in birds. Birds have a very weak muscle structure around their tail, they can't swing it around and smack stuff with it and whatnot. They just, again, use it to navigate their flight path. So how do you tell the difference between a dinosaur and a bird? Well, again, does it have wings and feathers? Does it have a swivel wrist? And does it have a tiny fused tail? If it has those features, it's a bird. If it does not, then it is a dinosaur. Those are how you actually tell the difference between them and everything. So dinosaurs did not turn into birds, all right? They, there's no evidence for this whatsoever. I don't care what Jurassic Park says. I used to really like those movies. That last one made me really mad. I almost wasn't able to sit through it. But luckily, I was at home watching it on TV. So if I had paid money to go to the movie theater to watch it, I'd have been more upset about it. But again, 
But the fact that they are pushing this narrative so hard, this evolutionary scale so hard against you know these ideas, it really ends up being a major problem for creationists. But again, if you know what you're looking at, you can firmly defeat it because there's actually no evidence whatsoever for it. So why do they still say it? Because again, we cannot break the evolutionist worldview. They have this bias, they're wanting this to be true, so they're going to stick with it no matter what the evidence actually says. So when we come back, we're actually going to begin looking at God's Word. And we'll start looking at what the Bible actually says about dinosaurs and see if there's any dinosaurs in the Bible. Uh, anybody want to take a guess if they're actually in the Bible? Yeah, they are. All right. Y'all want a prize? <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and take a little bit of a break, and then we'll come back. <laughs> 